Well, good morning. So glad you're here to worship with us at the Journey Church this morning. Well, I'm excited that it's Easter time. I love Christmas and I love all the other times of the year where we preach God's Word, but I especially love Easter. And so this past Sunday, we began our Easter sermon series. There's going to be four sermons in the series. We began with Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 28. Here was the title of last week's message. If you didn't get a chance to catch it, it's on our YouTube channel for the church. Go out there. I believe it'll bless your life. Jesus labored in his own kingdom, and now he has us laboring in his kingdom. Jesus labored in his own kingdom, and now he has us laboring in his kingdom. That was Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 28. And then today is our Palm Sunday message. Jesus died for his kingdom. Jesus died for his kingdom. We'll be in three sets of passages today. Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, and Matthew 27, verses 33 to 56. Well, last week in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 28, we talked about working in our Heavenly Father's vineyard, also means in our Father's kingdom. The Father sent His Son, Jesus, to work in His kingdom. And we learned that all believers... All followers of Jesus Christ, all Christians, all of the people that are born again are all laborers in God's vineyard, in God's kingdom. Therefore, you and I are not simply attenders or spectators or fans of Jesus Christ, but rather you and I are laborers, you and I are workers, you and I are servants. We learned last week that working in the fields... Farming is a daylight to dark job. We learn that farming is hard, hot, dirty, dusty, backbreaking work. And let me pause right there. I had a member tell me right after the sermon yesterday and said, Pastor, you are not a good spokesman for getting people to go into the farming industry. Well, you need to know what it is you're signing up for if you're going to become a farmer and buy a tractor and a track of land and start the practice of farming. You need to know what you're getting into. Well, when people come to faith in Christ, we need to tell them what they're getting into. Yes, Jesus has graciously given you eternal life. He has died on the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection paid the penalty for all of your sins, and you go to heaven when you die. Praise God. But then comes the time of serving and laboring and working in his kingdom until he takes you to be with him. The disciples learned that serving in Jesus' kingdom is no cakewalk. If you missed last Sunday's sermon, I highly recommend you go back and watch it. I truly believe it will help your perspective. We also learned that we need to daily roll up our sleeves and serve in Jesus' kingdom. We did a little visual to help us remember that. We actually needed to roll up our sleeves. I actually took my sleeves and I undid them and I rolled them up. And some of you in the congregation that just had on short sleeve shirts, I wanted you to do the practice of just visually doing that this week. Did you do that this week? Actually remembered that you're not just a Christian going to die and go to heaven one day, but that you are rolling up your sleeves... And so are your other brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can serve in the Father's vineyard, in the Father's kingdom. Let's take a minute and look at the Easter sermon series and the four messages that are in it. Last week, Jesus labored in his kingdom. And then today on Palm Sunday, Jesus died for his kingdom. And then next Sunday on Easter Sunday, Jesus reigns over his kingdom And then the Sunday following Easter, Jesus is coming back to live and lead in his own kingdom. So as you can see, Jesus himself is personally and intimately invested in his Father's kingdom. Just after Jesus taught his disciples about laboring in his kingdom in Matthew chapter 20, Next, in Matthew chapter 20, 17 through 19, Jesus makes sure to tell his disciples ahead of time that he is going to be arrested, cruelly tortured, and then killed. So the disciples knew that before they even arrived in Jerusalem that they were headed into a hotbed of trouble and tragedy. Then in Matthew chapter 27, verses 33 to 56, tragedy struck 
hard, just like Jesus said it would. Also, on a side note, the Apostle Peter should not have been surprised at all on Thursday evening when the Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter had already been told this would happen. So why did he try to cut off Malchus's ear with his sword? The reason? Because Peter was not prepared to stand firm on what Jesus had previously told him. As Pastor Chuck Swindoll would say, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Warnings can help us to be ready for what is coming. Matthew chapter 20 verses 17 through 19. In these next three verses, it's where Jesus foretold his arrest, torture, death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 17, as Jesus was about to go to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves, and on the way, he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised up. Next is their arrival at Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, this is known as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Verse 1, when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, which we know that means Jerusalem, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. If you notice here, Jesus rode on the foal and not on the mother of the foal. Verse 6, then Jesus went and did just, the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. I love this time of Palm Sunday because we have these little palm branches that we like to bring out each year. And uh, what we do is we kind of reenact a little bit, if you would, the fact that the people would actually cut these branches out of palm trees. And actually, they were doing this to honor Christ. They were actually throwing these down on the ground in front of him as a sign of honor. At this point in Jesus' ministry, people have come to love him. Not everyone. Some have come to know him. But they're actually laying down these palm branches. And it wasn't just palm branches. They were actually laying down their coats. They would take off their outer garments and they would actually uh, lay their coats down. And some would hold palm branches. And they were saying what you were seeing in the text. And we're going to read it in just a minute. Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were praising him and giving him honor and adoration. And so, basically, we end up having this situation where they're giving him extreme honor at this point. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Now, isn't that amazing that Jesus and his disciples got to hear this? Because you know in just four short days they're going to say, Crucify him! Crucify him! But Jesus knows this is coming. Verse 10, when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now we're skipping ahead from Palm Sunday to Thursday night. We just go forward four more days in the week. Matthew chapter 27, verses 33 to 56, and this is the crucifixion. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. 
And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sakpathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs were opened And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Do you get this scene? Earthquakes. People that are dead are coming out of tombs alive and walking around and people are seeing them. He's the resurrection and life. People are already being resurrected. Verse 53, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, truly this was the Son of God. Many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now let's recap the progression, the stages, if you will, of this specific week in Jesus' life and death. First, Jesus teaches on labor and service in his kingdom. Before this happens, he wants believers to know this is not a cakewalk. This is hard work. This is labor. This is service. You need to roll up your sleeves and get busy serving the kingdom of God. Is Jesus not been serving God? Yes, for three and a half years, his public ministry has been such as he's been out there every day walking those dirty, dusty roads, healing people, touching lepers, and doing what he's commanding his disciples to do. He's saying, I'm doing this with you. I didn't just tell you to go do it. I came from heaven down here to show you that I'm doing it next to you. And so Jesus labored definitely labored in his own kingdom, and he had the other believers laboring as well. So he taught on labor and service in the kingdom of God. Second, Jesus reveals his upcoming arrest, torture, and death. This wasn't just something that got out of hand. This wasn't just something that the Pharisees and the elders and the scribes decided to do and the Romans decided to do once Jesus made his triumphal entry, and then Jesus and the disciples are all caught off guard. Jesus is saying, listen, this is all prophetic. This is how the Father decided for this to happen even before the world began. And he's telling them, before we get to Jerusalem, you need to know that they're going to arrest me. They're going to cruelly torture me. They're going to mock and scourge me. They're going to kill me. I'm going to be buried. Third, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as her rightful king. Did you know that their king actually walked in the gates? 
They've had so many earthly kings from King Saul, King David, King Rehoboam, and on and on and on and on and on. They had all these men that were earthly kings, sinners. And yet that coming son of David, the son of man, the son of God, Jesus the Christ, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, walked into their city gates and they killed him. The true king, the one and only king, walked in their city gates. He rode in on a donkey and they killed him. Fourth, Jesus' prophecy comes true and he is indeed arrested, tortured, and dies and comes back to life on the third day, just as he prophesied. All of this leaves us with a beautiful picture of how God thinks versus how man thinks. Are you familiar with Isaiah 55, 8 through 9? God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth are his ways than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts. Think about this with me for just a moment. If you and I were to know for sure that we were going to be arrested on a specific day, mocked and spit on, cruelly tortured, thrown into prison, and we knew that the verdict was going to be guilty and the sentence was going to be death and we knew that we were being wrongfully accused and that we had God's power to stop the entire thing before it ever happened, wouldn't we stop it? I don't know of anybody that wouldn't stop it. Do you? Here's the thing. If Jesus had stopped it, and had made everything turn out correctly in his arrest and trial, then he would not have died. And if he didn't die, there would be no payment for my and your sins or for the sins of the entire world. Do you see? God knows when to stop something and when not to stop something. I've used this example many, many times. Way back at 9-11, I've asked people, if you'd have had the power of God, and you saw the planes headed to the Twin Towers, would you have stopped them? Everybody I've ever talked to said, well, of course, yes, absolutely. I said, then you'd have been wrong. They're like, why? If I had the power, I could have stopped all of that. I know, and you'd have been wrong. God had that power, and he chose not to stop it because he had a better purpose. He had a plan to work through that evil. So see, if we had God's power, that would be very dangerous, wouldn't it? Because we would use our human thinking, which is down here. We'd go with what we thought was the best way. Our thinking, instead of his way and his thinking. Thank God nobody here on this planet had the power to divert those planes. Because we'd have been diverting the very plan and activity of God. Now, let's transfer this to my in your life. Here's a spiritual thought to take away from today's message. You may want to write this on the back of your bulletin, or you can put it in your notes app. But I guarantee you this can help you in days ahead. In all manners of stresses and trials and problems and difficulties, you can think back on this or pull your bulletin out or look in your notes app, and I believe it will help you. Here's a spiritual thought to take away from today's message. Quote, when bad and wrongful situations come to us, Don't run. Stand firm. I'm going to repeat these, so you can just keep writing as I'm reading, and I'll keep repeating it. When bad and wrongful situations come to us, don't run. Stand firm. Because the Lord may have a better, more beautiful, more special, more long-lasting blessing coming as a result. That's why a lot of us are so confused today as we, why doesn't God stop this? Why doesn't God stop Russia from invading Ukraine? Why doesn't God do this? Why didn't God divert the Twin Towers? Why doesn't God heal cancer? Why does God little, little, little babies get cancer? We've got all of these questions. Why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God do that? And have you ever heard somebody say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why he... No, you're not. When you see God in all of his glory, you're just going to praise him for who he is and fall to your face and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. When bad and wrongful situations come to us, don't run. Don't panic. Stand firm. 
because the Lord may have a better, more beautiful, more special, more long-lasting blessing coming as a result. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that the book of Job is in the Bible. I am not at all happy about what God put Job through. And not that he just allowed it. God set it up. God looked at Satan and said, have you considered my man Job? I'm sitting there reading the book going, shh, don't point him out. Don't point out one of your believers to Satan. No. But God said, hey, have you considered him? Well, yeah, I've considered him, but I can't touch him. You've got a hedge of protection around him. Well, that's great. And then God said, well, then I'll remove the hedge of protection. I'm like, no. God, what are you doing? No. Have you lost your mind? No. God purposefully set this up. So that he could prove to Satan and his demons and all the angelic hosts and believers for decades and decades and generations to come that there are believers that love God so much that it doesn't matter what God brings upon them in pain and suffering and trials, they will love him till they die. God had a purpose behind what he did to poor Job and Mrs. Job and their children. There was a purpose. And we're like, God, why didn't you stop it? God set it up. At the end of the day, the cross of Christ has the final word. Amen? Think about what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the elders, think about all of those people in the crowds that were young, crucify him, crucify him. All the mocking, all the scourging, all the beating. If you saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, you know what I'm talking about. Isn't that hard to watch? That was very realistic. God set that up so that the greatest story ever told would save me and save you and save whoever's watching this sermon by YouTube video. At the end of the day, the cross of Christ has the final word. What Jesus did on the cross is paying for the penalty of mine and your sins. That can never be undone. That is a fact in history and also in heaven. So if you're here today or you're watching this sermon via video, and you have yet to believe in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, do not throw away the most beautiful, powerful, priceless, eternal gift you have been offered. If you're here today, or you're watching this sermon via video, and you have already believed in what Jesus did on the cross in paying for the penalty of mine your sins, then please do two things. Let's just say do three things. Number one, live like you truly are a child of God until you die or Jesus comes back first. No more living a hypocritical lifestyle. Number two, make sure to share with other people that you come in contact with so that they too can come to know and believe in the gospel as well. Do not withhold the life-saving gospel of Jesus from those that are perishing. Can you imagine yourself being in the desert... And you yourself having one canteen of water, and then you run into somebody else and they've not had any water to drink, and you have life-sustaining water in your hands in a canteen, and you're like, no, 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 this is just for me. This is just for me. And you know without that water they're going to die. Would you hold on to all of that water without giving them a sip? That's like saying, I've been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is for me. Well, I'm a sinner and I want to go to heaven too. Every time we don't share the gospel, when God gives us that opportunity during our week or our weekend, we're holding on to that canteen of water. We're holding on to that life-giving water. We're holding on to the gospel and going, this is for me. When's the last time you shared the gospel? Do you not know any lost people? I know plenty of lost people. When's the last time you gave life-giving water to somebody in the desert, somebody that's a sinner, somebody that's dying, and not going where you're going? Let me tell you something. I don't want to go to hell. From what I've read about it in the Bible, it is not my happy place. And I don't think it would be your happy place. And by the way, it's not like a vacation where you go, and at the end of the time, you're done. It's eternal. Once you go to hell, there's no coming back. There's no end. Not even after two million years. 
Not after 10 billion years. I don't even know what the numbers are after that. There's no end. You can't add enough zeros. Burning in a lake of fire. And you have within you, if you're a believer, the gospel, the truth, the life-giving water, the salvation that they need. Number three, invite others to worship with you or invite them to go to a local Christ-centered, Bible-teaching, gospel-saturated church so that they can grow and they themselves can be on mission for Jesus. If you truly know what it means to go to church and worship Christ every weekend, we need to hunger and thirst for that to happen for others. We say that what Jesus did is the greatest story ever told. If that's true, then why don't we live like it and why don't we share it? We say it's the greatest story ever showed, but yet we'll tell the story of the Super Bowl, who won that. We'll, we'll tell the story of who won the Stanley Cup, we'll tell that. We'll say who won the World Series, we'll tell that. Or we'll repeat a whole bunch of news station articles that we see on the news or read in the newspaper. We'll share that. Or something that we heard that was profound this week, we'll share that story. We're constantly telling people stories. If we caught a fish this big, we say, look, I caught a fish this big. We're constantly sharing stories with people. But what about the greatest story ever told? Our world is dark, and it's getting darker. And I believe you know that. And what Christian or what church is not praying for revival these days? Oh, Lord God, we need revival. This church is praying for that on Thursday nights and Sunday mornings. We're praying for revival. But you know, you don't revive sinners, revive the dead. Revival comes to those that already know Christ. Revival is for the church. When we come alive, the rest of the culture will come alive. When we are on fire for Christ, that fire spreads. One little cigarette or one little match can be flicked into a dry forest. That one flame can set 600 acres on fire. But if the match goes out before it hits the dry grass, there's no fire. The fire went out in the match. If the match stays on fire, it'll burn down 600 acres. It'll burn down 1,000 acres. It'll burn down 50,000 acres before you can stop it. One flame can set an entire farm on fire. We're going to sing two invitation songs today. One is called, The Cross Has the Final Word. Those people, when Jesus rode in on the back of a donkey, and they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But then turned four days later and started mocking him, saying all manner of hateful and evil things against him. He was arrested, tortured, slapped, spit upon, beaten mercilessly. And then tortured on the cross, hung to die in suffocation. The cross has the final word. They didn't get the last word. They didn't have the final word. Jesus' cross has the final word all the way through the rest of our earthly history. And then all of the rest of eternity in heaven. Did you know that we will see the incarnate Christ? We will see where they pierced him. That will never go away. Every believer in heaven, you will always see what happened 2,000 years ago. We will see Jesus' resurrected body in heaven. And we'll see his wrists. We'll see his feet. The Father is spirit. Jesus was spirit until he came and became incarnate through Joseph and Mary. But then he went back to heaven. He still has his incarnate state, only glorified. But the Holy Spirit, spirit. So the Heavenly Father's Spirit, Jesus is incarnate. You'll still see the nail scars. And then the Holy Spirit's Spirit. We will see what happened at the cross for all eternity as we stand there and sing and praise and worship God for the rest of eternity. You'll see it. So the cross indeed has the final word. The next song will be that song that we sang again, Hosanna. This week, I had the idea of how wonderful it would have been if after Jesus was resurrected from the dead and was seen by over 500 people, that someone would have started to once again say to him, let's sing to him again, let's say to him again what we said when he came into Jerusalem riding on the donkey. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And this time, don't start yelling crucify him, crucify him four days later. 
And you know, in our generation, I don't know that we would yell, crucify him, crucify him. What I think we yell is ignore him, ignore him. You're really yelling, ignore him, ignore him, when you won't get up on your every morning and have a quiet time with him. And when you won't go to worship, ignore him, ignore him. All is good. Everything's fine. I'm still saved. Ignore him, ignore him. What is it that we say in our generation? In their generation, it was crucify him, crucify him. In our generation, it's like, ignore him, ignore him. It's all good. I hope that you will sing these next two songs as praise from the bottom of your feet all the way up through your heart, through your mind, through your soul, through your lips, that when you sing this, you'll realize that one day you're going to see the incarnate Christ in heaven and see what happened on the cross. The cross has the final word. No one in history and no one in the future can undo the fact of the cross. Amen? Our gospel is settled in history and in heaven. Let's stand now and let's sing to Christ.